Oh, thanks, Dave, very much. Yeah, I'm very hopeful that um, this talk will follow on very nicely from Catherine's, um, probably more by luck than uh, judgment, but I hope that it will offer something that complements what Catherine's been saying, but perhaps just take us in one or two different directions. And particularly what I'm hoping to talk about over the next 20 minutes or so is think about relationships between environment and health, but more particularly inequalities in health. So in other words, what role does the environment, what role do the places that we live, work and play in matter for differences in health amongst different social groups? And hopefully this leads um, ultimately to all sorts of not just in hopefully interesting uh, academic uh, uh, arguments, but also offers some policy options to trying to think about differences in health status. So um, I'm a geographer and I've I think that may come through as we talk about some of the geographical processes that our group, the Centre of Research on Environment, Society and Health, have been interested in. So as a geographer, I think it's almost obligatory to um, have a map in my talk, so I thought I'd better not disappoint. Um, this is a, a talk of, uh, talk, this is a, 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 a pair of images of life expectancy across the UK. And very simple uh, piece of mapping, just looking at how life expectancy by local authorities varies across the country and this is a, this is a, a slide that I use quite a lot in uh, teaching because I think it's actually very powerful and there's an awful lot, awfully, uh, an awful large number of stories I think to tell from this but I may well just say one or two. I guess what it's showing with uh, female life expectancy on the left and male life expectancy on, on the right is that um, we have some very uneven health in the UK. Uh, we tend to have much better health the further south we go, the south and east of England um, having much better health, at least according to this measure. Um, than much parts of the northern parts of the country. It also starts to show some of the post-industrial regions of the UK, South Wales, uh, North West England, North East England, parts of Scotland, fa faring fairly poorly in terms of health. So what I hope um, I'll give a bit of a snippet of over the next, uh, the next few minutes is what are some of the underlying environmental factors that affect this? Um, what, can, what can thinking about environment, health and resilience, resilience br bring to our understanding of some of these issues. Um, so, three questions I want to, I want to try and uh, briefly address as we go through. Firstly, is health getting better everywhere? Um, what, is health getting better for everybody? Uh, and if so, if not, where, where is health getting better compared to other places? Why are geographical inequalities in health changing? What are some of the factors that mean that, 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 that the inequalities in health may be getting different over time? And, if, and thirdly, can environmental interventions help to reduce inequalities? So can we think about environmental processes as a way of trying to address um, those stark inequalities that we saw in that previous map? And I'll do this by way of three examples um, that are very much overlapping, as you'll see. Um, the physical, thinking about the physical environment, how does the physical environment affect inequalities? How does a more kind of built environment, some of the things that Catherine was, was, was uh, picking up on, how does that affect inequalities? And then think about housing, and as I'll go on to say a little bit about, housing has been a bit of an ignored um, topic in public health over the last couple of decades, but um, perhaps one that's about to explode back onto the scene for reasons that I'll explain. Um, so, um, what's the sort of big story with um, health in the UK? And in many ways, health, public health is an enormous success story. If we chart back, again, this is using life expectancy right back to the mid-19th century on the left-hand side, we can see that over the last 150 years or so, life expectancy has, has roughly doubled. And pretty much year on year, with a, a very significant blip around the time of the First World War, that our health as a nation has got better and better and better. So there's a lot of good news when we think about public health in the UK. And the same for infant mortality. Infant mortalities drop from about 140,000 uh, per, th 140 per thousand um, births around to about five or six per thousand um, in 2014. So again, a, a remarkable story of success in terms of public health. However, we also have known for an awful long time that this hides a, ge a geographical story. Uh, inequalities in health have been noted for an awful long time. Um, here's some work that was done by the industrialist and social reformer Benjamin Seaborn Roundtree back at the end of the uh, 19th century. And he did some work at York looking at, in this particular case, um, chil children, deaths uh, amongst children under, before the age of one. And these are data per thousand. And we can see that in his kind of typology of places across the city of York, some quite distinct differences. So in the poorest parts of York, about one in four babies didn't make it to the age of one, whereas amongst what he called the servant-keeping class, 
a sign of its particular times there is more like one, one in ten. So we also already start to, to get a sense of the inequalities in health, but also the geographical differences that existed during Victorian England. Um, and trying to put inequalities, some of those inequalities, in a little bit more of an historical context, if we try our best to chart them over time, here's some data using something called the relative index of inequality, and the detail of the metric doesn't matter. But just to say it's a very widely used measure in public health to try and say how unequal is health amongst a particular population. And this particular population um, is England and Wales, as you can see from the 1920s through to fairly recent times. And you can see that roughly speaking from about the late 1920s, early 1920s through to the 1970s, there was a, uh, a reduction in um, health inequalities. But since around about the late, of the 19, late 1970s, early 1980s, we've seen some really quite, sh quite sharp rises in health inequality. So a really important, significant um, public health challenge. And as Dave said at the start, one of the wicked, public one of the wicked challenges I think we face as society. Um, more locally, what, how does this play out? Well, we just have to go um, a little bit along the M8 to see some very stark differences in health. This is some data that was widely reported a little while ago by the, by the World, he World Health Organization. In Glasgow, to, um, two suburbs, Lindsay and uh, Carlton, which are only 14 kilometres apart. We have to go 14 kilometres across the city of Glasgow to find a 28-year difference in life expectancy. Some really enormous, and, and even by international standards, some really stark differences in health across one urban area. Uh, but it's not just the sort of the best and the worst, that's a very extreme example. It's also across the whole population. So this is data for, again for um, England and Wales for all areas across the whole of the country for, um, where we've uh, sorted uh, all the areas according to a, a measure of socioeconomic status from the least deprived, the, the richest and poshest places on the left, to the most socially disadvantaged on the right. And you can see, particularly for males, but for males and females, this, this clear gradient that goes across all of these 20 um, equal groupings of areas, with um, uh, uh, mortality rates, I should have said, on the uh, y-axis here, roughly three times what they are um, in the most deprived compared to the least deprived, uh, at least for males. So we see this gradient across all areas. It's not just a kind of best and worst uh, case scenario. But why does all this matter? So hopefully that gives a sense of there's a very clear evidence we have inequalities in health. They seem to be rising, particularly over the last 30 to 35 years. But why does this matter? And I guess in the literature, there are probably four arguments depending on, depending on your philosophical or political perspective. But firstly, they're avoidable. They don't need to happen. Inequalities in health stem from identifiable policy options exercised by government. So they, and they're not inevitable, they are avoidable. Others argue a, a slightly su a more subtle case and say it's a moral obligation for society to think about this. It's not fair, it's not unjust that some people, due to where and uh, who they are born to, have a very different health status than other people. So there's a moral imperative there. Others would argue it's a win-win. If we start to address inequalities, then we all gain from this. We all gain from having a healthier and fairer society, both in social terms but also in economic terms. Which leads me to the last one. There's an economic imperative. Perhaps this is the, mo the more kind of uh, liberal argument um, it, uh, during a period of austerity um, where we have rising healthcare costs. Um, it's an economic imperative to try and improve inequalities. The four different arguments um, that have been used to try and say we need to, to think about these things quite carefully and need to start to think of coming up very quickly with policy options to address health inequalities. And I think I'd probably go a little bit further and say that inequality, not just in terms of health, but all sorts of other, other measures, social, economic and wealth, is arguably the defining feature, the defining issue of the 21st century. We've all got a lot of healthier, but that, that health has not been equally shared, particularly over the last 30 or 40 years. So that gives a sense of, sort of some of the reasons why we might think about health inequalities, but what are some of the uh, reasons for why our health in the UK and elsewhere is becoming increasingly uneven? Well, first of all, there are all sorts of structural reasons we might think about, issues to do with wealth inequality, to do with the labour market, to do with um, changes to welfare, the welfare state, uh, and of course issues to do in, in the very contemporary sense with regards to austerity. So there's all sorts of significant structural reasons. 
But also, um, I think there's a very large body of evidence, of which um, Catherine's touched on already, to suggest that the environments, the places that we live, also are changing. Um, and these are important for health. And I guess we would argue that places are expressions of wider socioeconomic fa factors, as well as the people living there. So in other words, the, the, some of the structural factors play out locally in geographical contexts to affect people's lives, including their health. But also, importantly, that places can, can work to constrain or enable good health. Um, so places can play, environments can play a very important role in, in understanding health per se, as Catherine said, but also, as I'm arguing, in terms of inequalities. And if, if that's the case, if places do matter for health, then if those places are very uneven, very unequal, the environments vary enormously from, from place to place, the environmental goods and bads are unequally equally distributed, then it seems plausible that that's an important factor in understanding some of the maps and some of the distributions of health that I've just been showing you. And as Catherine said, you know, there's, a, there's a big literature here um, in the field of environmental justice and environmental injustice, thinking about the kind of social production of the environment. What are some of the social factors to lead to these un uneven distribution of environmental factors? And I want to illustrate this through three very specific uh, examples. The first one I want to touch on is some work um, uh, uh, that I've been working on, but also others, around the physical environment, we might think as a physical environment. Um, one useful and uh, well-documented uh, environmental issue with regard to health, of course, is air pollution, something that's very much been in the media spotlight because, of course, London got a little bit polluted, so suddenly it makes national news. Um, and air, air pollution is a, is a broader concern, not just to London, of course, the whole country. And you may have seen this article a little while ago um, in the BBC and lots of other media outlets about air pollution being linked to around about 20, 28,000 deaths, including about 2,000 up here in Scotland. So this is a pretty significant environmental issue in terms of health. Globally, of course, it's even more of an issue. Um, the World Health Organization has estimated that air pollution is linked to about 7 million or nearly one in eight death, deaths per year, um, which makes it one of the world's, most, world's largest environmental health risks. So we're not talking trivial environmental issues here, um, we're talking about some significant concerns. Thinking about this kind of a European scale, we could think about this in different ways, but let's just look at the European scale. This is um, a map of particulate matter, so this is, I should say, some work that a group of us um, at Kresh have been working on with the European Commission. Uh, and this is quite a simple map of particulate pollution across the European Union in 2006 and then more recently in 2010. And it shows, of course, there's, very un there's great unevenness in terms of pollution, much higher pollution in Eastern Europe, uh, re representing the kind of industrial uh, and economic position those countries are in. But also particularly parts of Northern Italy have some of the highest levels of air pollution and indeed parts of central London as well. So there's, a lot, of course, of much geographical differences in health. But that only tells part of the story. If we return to this kind of notion of environmental justice, whether um, environments are socially as distributed as well as physically distributed, um, our analysis at the European level seems to suggest that plays out. So all of these different dots represent different regions of Europe, the different regions I showed you in that previous map. Uh, the red dots uh, being the um, poorest communities, the lowest income places, the lowest GDP areas, and the crosses on the right-hand side being the highest income. And you can see, not a, a desperately strong pattern, but nonetheless, there's a, 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 an approximate uh, linear pattern with a lot of variation within each group that suggests that poorer parts of Europe tend to have higher levels of air pollution. Poorer places tend to have uh, uh, levels of uh, air pollution. And this becomes quite significant in terms of health and we actually look at some of the most extreme events. So these are the kind of extreme events, these are the thresholds that different organisations, the European Union, the World Health Organisation, are say are really significant in terms of health. These sort of episodes, these sorts of averages are, are really uh, significant health concerns. And you can see that it's the, lowest, the low GDP areas which have the highest proportion of um, significant pollution episodes <coughs> in Europe. So from a health perspective, uh, it would suggest environmental justice, injustice issues, but also this could well start to play um, an important role in terms of understanding European-wide health inequalities across different social groups. Now, the second example I wanted to uh, draw, draw, draw your attention to was rather than thinking about the physical environment per se, but actually think more about the kind of neighbourhood, the, the built environment, if you like, some of the issues that Catherine was uh, drawing um, our, our attention to. <coughs> 
Um, and one of the ways in which our group has been thinking about um, health inequalities in the built environment is thinking about some of the uh, environmental or place-based factors that affect health behaviours. And there's all sorts of things we're looking at, but I just want to give you one example. Um, this is looking at tobacco outlet density and alcohol outlet density. And there seems to be some evidence, international evidence, suggesting that the local environment, the local retail environment, really does matter in terms of understanding people's behavioural responses. Um, it, but if we look at that, this is data, I should have said, for the whole of Scotland, for both tobacco and al alcohol outlet density, uh, plotted against uh, the percentage income deprived, so our socioeconomic measure. And again, there seems to be a fairly clear linear trend for both tobacco outlet density and, and alcohol outlet density, in that more disadvantaged, more socially disadvantaged neighbours also tend to have much more readily available access or greater density to uh, to, to retailers selling these particular products. So again, this, this is arguably acts as a prompt for those sorts of behaviours. And that's kind of what our analysis has been showing. Um, this is some data using the Scottish Health Survey and, and looks at all of the respondents and splits them up according to their tobacco outlet density quintile, so how, how available tobacco is in those local communities. And it does seem to affect, in this case, the odds of being a current smoker. So you're more likely to be a smoker if you live in the most... Uh, the, in, um, in the most uh, dense, tobacco outlet dense um, areas. Once we adjust through all the other things that we know also affect smoking, so once we account for all those things, there seems to be a significant effect. So again, it would be supporting that kind of notion that place is a matter for behaviours. And then this takes us back to um, our study that um, Catherine was mentioning of green space. So it's not just the outlets and retailers that matter, but as Catherine said, also the green environments. And this again is, is, is calling upon the research of one of our colleagues, uh, Richard uh, Mitchell. Um, and I'll just draw your attention to the top graph. This is quite a complicated story, but along the um, x-axis here, this is levels of greenness. So these are the most green areas on the right-hand side, and these are measures of health going up the y-axis. And basically what this is showing is not just, not just as Catherine showed that green spaces are related to health, but also the greenest environments have the smallest health inequalities when we adjust for other, other things. So it's saying greener places have smaller inequalities in health. So there's an important public health message here as well in that uh, green environments might be part of a, a solution in terms of addressing health inequalities. Um, so my third, the third example is, uh, I'd like to, to just briefly say something about is what I, I see as kind of an emerging or re-emerging public health issue, and that's the issue of uh, housing. Um, housing's been ignored largely as a, um, uh, a public health concern for a, lo a long time. When it has been studied, people have been interested particularly in the quality of the housing. Is it central heating? Is it, is it damp and so on? The actual uh, the, the phys physicality of, of the particular home. But I think there's a, there's, a, there's a growing and rather different issue with regard to housing and health that's, that, that uh, is, is, is somewhat pressing in, in, in contemporary public health. First thing to say, I think, is perhaps this is rather obvious, is that housing, of course, is central to health and well-being. We all need somewhere warm and secure to live in. But in the UK, as is well documented, particularly in, in uh, south of the border, that finding a place to live is becoming increasingly difficult. Uh, a lot of this is to do with costs, and we now see lots of uh, uh, data that suggests that many, particularly younger houses, are spending more than half of their take-home income uh, on, their, on their housing costs. And perhaps it's not surprising amongst council tenants, uh, people are getting very clearly into, into arrears due to both low, low wages and welfare changes, as well as housing costs. And amongst homeowners, a lot of people are struggling to pay for housing. And it's that thought that about 2.5 million people are now um, behind with their payments on their mortgages. So this is sort of telling a picture of somewhat of, uh, uh, of debt, of uncertainty, insecurity, and possibly fear and precarity as well. So again, this hasn't really been covered in the public health literature, but a, a potentially rather important concern. At the same time, as well at the same time, we're getting our it's becoming harder to find houses, particularly in the southeast of England. We've never had so many properties that are empty or at least are underoccupied. So it's estimated there's close to a million empty properties in the UK. We know that our housing stock, we have about 66 million bedrooms, 55 million people. Um, so you could argue here, I think it's not the absolute lack of housing as a concern, but it's that distribution of housing. Um, and uh, we also know that since the 1980s, how housing space has become increasingly unequal. That distribution of housing has become much more unequal. 
largely possibly because we see housing, housing as a wealth creator before we see it as a home. And we see this hoarding of uh, housing amongst uh, a more and more of an elite, uh, a high income group, where fewer people are acquiring rather large numbers of property, which of course is not disconnected to issues of wealth inequalities that have risen to Victorian levels, as this um, uh, graph is starting to show, the rather sharp decrease, uh, decrease in um, wealth inequality since uh, just before the First World War, but again a rather sharp rise in more recent years. So this is a quite a good example of where big macro level factors play out at the local level, in this case affecting um, housing availability, the cost of housing and of course putting people in some precarious positions. But this matters, uh, why does this matter in terms of um, health? Well there's lots of evidence that suggests that precarity with regards to housing affects physical and mental health. Stressful environments promote substance abuse, criminal behaviour, mental illness, physical illness, family violence, amongst all sorts of other factors. And I suppose what this does perhaps draw our attention to, that neighbourhood health is profoundly shaped by decisions of external actors. In other words, decisions taken around the distribution of housing, the availability of housing, of course, play out at a local level and affect people in all sorts of ways, including with regards to their health. OK, so just I think I'll probably my time's about up, so I'll just say, I can make a couple of um, concluding comments. I guess my sort of overarching um, uh, take-home message here is that I think that understanding and addressing health inequalities is a really key issue for those of us working in public health. Perhaps hasn't had the uh, priority that some of us might like, but it is, a, I would argue, a priority challenge for public health researchers and, and people working in policy positions in this area. I guess what we, we need to do as a community is think about a vision for an alternative to socio-economic polarisation. We need to think about what it is that, what are some of the reasons why we're becoming uh, more and more unequal, what are some of the underlying factors, both environmental, social, political, economic and so on. And I don't think we can really escape the, the kind of macro level story that income and wealth inequalities are very much part of this story. But also, as we've been saying, the environment matters and those two uh, are of course not disconnected. So what is to be done? I guess the first um, suggestion from the, the, uh, the, the examples we've been looking at uh, today is that it's important to think about what I've called pro-equity concerns in environmental policy making. So we looked at the example of air pollution a moment ago. Air pollution policy making rarely thinks about equity, rarely thinks about inequalities in health. Clearly as our evidence the European scale showed and other studies have shown more locally, there are big social differences in pollution. Uh, uh, policies that are uh, 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 attempting to address air, air pollutants need to take into uh, account these important equity concerns. And then secondly, designing neighbourhood built environments that, that uh, Catherine introduced us to, we need to incorporate public health concerns more broadly. We need to think about when we're constructing our neighbourhoods, the places that we live, we need to pay very close attention to public health concerns, particularly make design decisions to support healthy choices. And as I hope that uh, becomes, it's becoming clear from my talk, that this also has a lot of potential, not just to improve health per se across the population, but also to reduce inequalities. A real, a real opportunity there, I think. And then thirdly, and as I say, this is a slightly more um, out there kind of um, public health issue, and that's of housing, particularly the precarity of housing. And I think this is where we do need a big cultural shift, shift from thinking about housing as a, um, a shelter rather than as an investment. In terms of housing, I think what this, this, this um, looks like is thinking about the rights of tenants, tenants, the rights of tenants to stay in the homes, of course, issues that are well outside the public health sector, but, but nonetheless, nonetheless have profound public health implications. This involves, evol involves deterring landlords for prioritising profits over offering um, inadequate accommodation, and also rent controls. And when I, when I wrote this a week or so ago, I thought that was a quite an unlikely immediate policy option, but it's something the Labour Party uh, actually raised last week, which is uh, rather rather um, reassuring. And then finally issues around housing and land tax, housing valued for its use rather than exchange value. So in other words again thinking about trying to prompt and promote um, the, a cultural shift in the way in which um, housing is distributed and, and ensuring that housing is uh, uh, seen as a public good rather than a financial opportunity for, for, for investment. I think I'll probably leave it there, other than to say that um, if you're interested in any more of our work, I should have put up our webpage, but if you look at um, the uh, Crash webpage, Google Crash, we've got various papers and reports of some of the work that I've been talking about, 
as well as downloads of some of the data sets for those of you interested in getting hold of it. And I should say, also say a lot of this work has been funded by project, um, uh, through a project uh, funded by the European Research Council, who we're very grateful to. Thank you. Thank you. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.